I'm Bob Dempster. This is my wife, Diane. We're building the first aircraft to fly around the world. This is a reproduction of the Douglas World Cruiser, and we're going to fly it around the world. Here, here it is, my baby. The first flight around the world started in Seattle. It was the 6th of April, 1924. There were four aircraft. There was the Seattle, the command ship, the Chicago, the Boston, and the New Orleans. Uh, the unfortunate Seattle crashed in Alaska. The crew was uh, saved. They walked out. Uh, they lost the Boston in the North Atlantic off the Faroe Islands. They were rescued. They were given the training plane, which became the Boston II, and the flight continued around the United States back to Seattle, uh, landed here the 28th of September, 1924, for the first circle navigation of the world. You know, it was, I hate to use the word brave because they felt they were doing their duty, but it was really quite a courageous thing, not only for the air service, but for the, uh, the government to fund this and for the Navy to support this uh, in all the countries they flew through. They would go into these countries and they would be like aliens from another world. And in fact, they were. And people had never even seen airplanes. And so I think that uh, uh, it was really quite a uh, tour de force. Uh, for aviation, and it showed the world that this was not a toy or uh, entertainment. This was a serious uh, opportunity to explore the world and to connect nations. Well, we're here at Randy's, one of our favorite restaurants in uh, Watering Holes with a good cup of coffee. And uh, behind us is a uh, map, and Diane and I uh, took our 93 Super Cub in 94 and started to fly around the world. When we got to uh, the Air Force Museum, lo and behold, there was one of the original world cruisers, the number four, the New Orleans. And of course, we're flying around the world, so that was kind of interesting. And then we got to the Smithsonian, and there's number two, the New Orleans, uh, the uh, Chicago. And you know, okay, now the thing, the, the, you know, the momentum's building. After we got to England and came home, uh, we started to think about, you know, the, the, their flight and our flight, and I started doing more research on the details. Eventually, we flew around to Japan and uh, shipped the plane home, uh, the Super Cub. And so, uh, at that point, I wanted to fly back to Japan, but all of a sudden now I became obsessed with the original flight around the world. And so, at that point in 2001, we started building a world cruiser. Currently, the airplane is uh, completely finished. It's in uh, parts. Uh, the, uh, the wings uh, are, are folding wings. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to move it out and start assembling it. Uh, we'll uh, have pulled the engine out of it at that time. The engine and the radiator weighs 1,000 pounds all by itself, so it's pretty heavy. So we'll put it together, put it up on the landing gear, reinstall the engine, and start hooking up all the system. I'm standing on the stub wing of the airplane. Uh, I'm about six feet high, so you can see how, how big the spaces are. Uh, the wings are 50 feet, and they swing back. Uh, when it goes on landing gear, of course, it's setting down low now. When it goes on the landing gear, it'll be about 13 and a half, 14 feet tall. On floats, it weighs four tons, actually about 8,200 pounds. So it's a very large airplane, even in the days uh, that it was built in. These are custom-made wheels, and uh, as you can see what the, what the size is and what it's gonna do to the height of the airplane when, when that comes up next week. Uh, for the tail wheel, the airplane originally had a tail skid, and so to, to uh, not dig up everybody's runway, we've got a BH-18 tail wheel for it. The airplane we're building is the Seattle, which was number one. And uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, we've copied this right off the uh, photographs and some of the research that we've done. Next, we have the logo. And now this was painted on all of the airplanes. And, uh, but because it was hand painted, it was all always a little bit different. The, <laughs> the essence was there, but a little artistic flavor on the cloud. This section of the airplane, this is actually a canvas cotton duck. And um, the air service particularly liked this plane because it was so accessible. So what you have here is these boot hooks and you can open it up. 
the airplane has 450 gallons of gas. There's four fuel tanks, one right here underneath the back seat. And of course, the webbing all makes that possible. There's one under the front seat. There's a vertical one in front of the uh, front cockpit. And then there's one up in the center wing section. So that's the 450 gallons of fuel. Uh, the airplane has a folding wing design. Uh, the the uh, hinge is this barrel on the back. And uh, originally I didn't know exactly how they worked. So I went to the crash site in Alaska and uh, was able to locate some pieces and verify the dimensions and the materials for those pieces. So that's been kind of the, some of the adventure, <laughs> pre-adventure to flying the World Cruiser. <laughs> Powering the uh, World Cruiser is the uh, Liberty V12. So it's a 12 cylinder engine. It was made by several manufacturers. This happens to be a Lincoln Liberty V12. Uh, we've run this on the test stand uh, successfully, <laughs> I'm happy to say. And so this will be the first engine for our flight test program. The Liberty V12 was an engine of about 400 to 420 horsepower on a good day. Uh, it was really a reliable engine, uh, even though it had exposed valve springs, which is kind of unusual. And of course, we'll be looping those before every flight of each day. Um, it burned about 36 gallons an hour, which seems pretty extreme, but that was at full power at 1700 RPM. Uh, in cruise, it was about 20 gallons an hour. Uh, the surprising statistic is not the fuel, it's the fact that it burned 1.5 gallons an hour at full throttle. And of course, like I say, in cruise, those numbers change a little bit. So it was only 1.3 gallons of oil an hour. There were no mosquitoes following this airplane. Of course, everything on the airplane is home built, including this beautiful custom-made radiator uh, by one of our local uh, guys, Lou White, in his radiator shop. And of course, on the front of the radiator, to keep the heat in, to, keep, to warm the engine up, uh, you have these louvers, which you go up and down. And our uh, good friend, Kent McCormick, just finished these. And so you, uh, you would think that uh, uh, being a water-cooled engine, uh, that you'd want to uh, have, you know, a lot of cooling on it. But in fact, uh, in places like Alaska, you have to have the shutters and close them up so that you keep the heat in. This is looking through the rear uh, cockpit. This is the uh, throttle quadrant. This is actually the throttle itself. Uh, then we have the uh, mixture, and this is the spark. So it's a, like a spark advance, like on an old Model T. It has a round, a uh, walnut rimmed uh, cast aluminum steering wheel uh, that of course turns uh, for the ailerons and back and forth for the elevators. We have a reproduction of the aluminum uh, seat and a uh, wobble pump uh, just like the original, only we're of course we're using a modern wobble pump. <laughs> Take one big leap uh, for Bob into space or the airplane <laughs> and here we go. Pull my leg out and I'm up in the cockpit and settling down. Ugh. So let's go, honey. <laughs> when I look at these guys, I realize uh, after trying to climb an airplane that they were young men with long legs. <laughs> but their, the emotions were, were so great be, because when Major Martin, uh, who crashed his plane in Alaska, uh, he said in his own personal diary, I wish I had died. You know, the importance of losing his command for this flight was so huge. You know, Peter Bowers, our friend, wrote in, in the, for the 50th anniversary, uh, this was akin to going to the moon in 1924. This was an extraordinary flight, the first flight around the world. In 2014, to celebrate the first world flight in, in 1924, it's the 90th anniversary, we're going to fly the reproduction, the Seattle 2 around the world and celebrate that flight. It's a, it's a large, bulky airplane. It'll be flying very slow. The approach speed was about 55 miles an hour. You know, so a flare at 50, you're on the ground. You'll have to add power to get to the first turnoff. Uh, on floats, a slight flare, and you're on the water, and it's done flying. So it's going to be a very heavy plane to fly uh, from the standpoint that the ailerons reach 13 and a half feet. So you've got 27 feet of ailerons on 100 foot of wing. So 
<laughs> Everything is going to be kind of slow. Uh, Diane and I have done a lot of long distance flying, both in our J3 Cub. Uh, we've taken it all the way to Puerto Rico. We've flown to Egypt in it. Uh, we've flown to Super Cub most of the way around the world. We're long distance flyers. We love it. We love to see places, explore the world, and uh, we love flying. And so, you know, here's a great opportunity to celebrate the original flight and see more of the world. This is the uh, the rudder. It's a pretty good size. Of course, they were, everything was underbuilt in those days for size on rudders. But one of the things I, I did was I built it according to the Douglas plans. Um, unfortunately, Douglas didn't build it according to plans. I went back to Smithsonian and I, well, we tried to fit it on the airplane. It didn't fit, that's what happened. So I went back and I looked at this area on the original airplane and in fact, they had modified that from the plans, but never changed the plans. So that's kind of part of the reticence that uh, uh, people have of using original uh, drawings is that sometimes they didn't use them. <laughs> As a first time builder, of course, I picked the doozy of a project. Uh, it seemed reasonable in the beginning, of course. And so I'm 85% done with 50% to go. I think all our builders out there know that. <laughs> I've learned that lesson. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, being a pilot, I want to go flying, but the uh, wonderful uh, ability to actually build something and think that you're going to get in it and fly away, you know, is just marvelous. You know, you feel akin to the Wright brothers, uh, you know, or Chanute or uh, uh, Lilienthal, any of the early uh, uh, pioneers. It seems like it's a long ways away, but when you get in your own home built airplane for the first time, you're right there with them, and that's going to be a great feeling, and I'm looking forward to that. On our J3 Cub and on our Super Cub, we had a little kind of motto that we had on the tail, and what that was was, dream like you mean it. And I guess essentially what that means to Diane and I is live your dreams. It uh, doesn't matter what they are, go for it. You know, if it's a hike, if it's creating something, you know, like a home-built airplane, uh, reading a book, whatever it is, uh, you know, follow your bliss, you know, uh, that's what life is about in learning and doing these kinds of things. This is the excitement of life and, and that's what, you know, what we do and enjoy. Mm -hmm.